This video is supported by Brilliant.org. SpaceX has been getting a lot of attention lately with their recent launch of the Falcon Heavy and the most awesome car commercial of all time. And we're all super excited about their plans to go to Mars. And all that's awesome, but we do tend to forget that NASA's already been to Mars. Several times. Today I am thrilled to be collaborating with Fraser Kane over at Universe Today. We're going to be talking about Mars robotic exploration. He's going to talk about the Curiosity mission, which is in its fifth year, has traveled like 17 kilometers, done all kinds of awesome crazy science, but I'll let him talk to you about it. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today and the host of The Guide to Space. Joe is going to bring you up to speed on the upcoming Mars 2020 rover. And once that's all in your brain, jump on over to my channel for a nostalgic look back at NASA's Curiosity rover. Seven minutes of terror, an epic climb across the brutal Martian landscape, adorable selfies. Curiosity passed 2,000 days on Mars. Triple the original mission plan. What have we learned so far? Now I'll be talking about the next NASA rover that's gonna be going to Mars, the Mars 2020 rover, and maybe some of the stuff they've got planned after that. So make sure and check out Fraser's video about Curiosity to get the full picture because, spoiler alert, the Mars 2020 rover is very heavily based on Curiosity and learned a lot of lessons from Curiosity. It's basically Curiosity's younger sister. Curiosity's younger, more high-tech, super advanced, 2,000 pound sister. 25 years ago, NASA launched their long-term program for exploring Mars called the Mars Exploration Program. And all of NASA's Mars missions since then have fallen under this program, including the Mars 2020 rover. The MEP had four stated goals. One, determine whether life ever arose on Mars. Understanding whether life ever arose on Mars helps us to understand how life could have evolved right here on Earth, and the possibility of intelligent life out there in the universe. Two, characterize the climate of Mars. Mars once had lakes of liquid water and probably a thicker atmosphere, much like Earth. You know what's also a lot like Earth? Earth. What happened on Mars? What went wrong and what can we learn to keep that from happening here? These are things we want to find out. Three, characterize the geology of Mars. Mars has some extreme geology. Mars has the tallest volcano in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons. It's 27 kilometers tall, three times taller than Everest. By the way, Everest is technically not the tallest mountain on Earth. That's actually the Hawaiian Islands, Mauna Kea specifically. Everest is the highest above sea level at 8,848 meters, but the base of Mauna Kea is at the ocean floor. That makes it 10,203 meters. The entire Hawaiian island chain was created by a hotspot of magma underneath the Pacific Plate. And over millions of years, as that Pacific Plate moved over the top of it, it would poke holes up through the plate and created these volcanoes that rose up to the surface and created the Hawaiian Islands. But Mars didn't have shifting plates, so once that magma started coming through the surface and created Olympus Mons, it just kept growing and growing and growing in the same spot. And with little weather or erosion to wear it all down, it became the biggest volcano in the entire solar system. We also know there used to be a magnetic field on Mars just like here on Earth. So what went wrong there? These are questions being examined. And number four, prepare for human exploration. When humans land on Mars, they're gonna be completely on their own. There's no getting on the ship and going back if something goes wrong. So before they go, every idea and every technology has to be tested to the limit. And we need to know as much as possible about how the environment there is gonna affect humans and our equipment so that we can be there for the longest amount of time possible. But those four goals have been the driving force behind NASA's Mars Exploration Program. Every single Mars mission in the last 25 years has fit into one or more of those goals. So how does the Mars 2020 rover address those concerns? With these four objectives. Science Objective A, explore once potentially habitable areas. Mars 2020 will be examining areas that were once underwater and have the most opportunity to have once created life. Science Objective B, seek biosignatures. The rover's suite of instruments are designed to examine the soil for traces of chemical elements that are associated with life. Science Objective C, sample caching. There's only so much we can do through a rover. What we really want is to return samples back to Earth so that we can study it here with all the technology and instruments we have available to us. So what Mars 2020 is going to do is it's actually going to collect samples in vials and store them away so that in future missions we could take those vials and bring them back home. This is the first planetary rover to ever do this, and it's a process called depot caching. Science Objective D, demonstrate in situ resource utilization. That is a boring word. But it's super important. In situ resource utilization, or ISRU, 
is the ability to make fuel and breathable air from the resources there on Mars. The new rover is going to have an experiment on board that's going to attempt to make oxygen from the CO2 in the atmosphere. In a real way, every Mars mission from SpaceX to NASA or anybody for that matter is going to have to be able to do this. So this is a really big deal, and this is the first time it's being tried on Mars. In terms of design, the Mars 2020 rover takes a bit of a if it ain't broke, don't fix it approach, and basically uses the same design as the Curiosity rover with a few upgrades, including new wheels because the Curiosity's wheels took more of a beating than they expected. And it uses the same crazy crane down uh, landing technique that Curiosity did, but it actually has a more advanced system with uh, sensors and something called terrain relative navigation, so it can actually use AI software to make it land exactly where they want it to. But it's the advanced suite of instruments on the Mars 2020 rover that really sets it apart from Curiosity and helps it to achieve its goals. It has two cameras on the probe's mast, one called MassCam Z, which is the main eye for the rover. It can take 360 degree panoramic 3D views with an advanced zoom that can see something the size of a housefly from the distance of a soccer field. And the second camera is called SuperCam. This can actually do a spectrographic analysis of a rock's chemical makeup from over 20 feet away by burning a hole in the rock as small as the point of a pencil with a laser. This was developed in conjunction with a team from France. PIXEL, or Planetary Instrument for X-ray Lithochemistry, will examine rock and soil samples for signs of ancient microbial life and can take extremely close-up images of soil samples down to the size of a grain of salt. MEDA, the Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer, is a contribution from a team in Spain. It's a tiny weather lab that measures wind speed, temperature, and humidity, and also gathers data about dust particles in the Martian atmosphere. RIMFAX, the radar imager for Mars subsurface experiment from Norway, is basically like a sonogram that can see tens of meters below the ground and detect elements down to the centimeter. This will help find underground water and ice on Mars. The aptly named Sherlock, or Scanning Habitable Environments with Raman and Luminescence for Organics and Chemicals, that's a mouthful, is a big sciencey way of saying it looks for signs of ancient life with UV light, much like forensic investigators at crime scenes, hence Sherlock. But Sherlock's going to carry a couple of interesting things with it. One of them is an actual meteorite from Mars it's going to use for calibration purposes. There's a handful of meteorites here on Earth, they're very rare, they're very special, that they believe actually were blasted off of the surface of Mars from a meteorite strike there, that then flew through the solar system and eventually landed on Earth. Sherlock is going to carry a piece of one of these meteorites with it to calibrate its laser there on the Martian surface, which means this is going to be the first time a piece of Mars is going to be taken back to Mars. The other thing is it's going to be taking samples of materials that may be used for Martian spacesuits so we can see how well they fare in the Martian environment. And last but definitely not least, this rover's got MOXIE. No, really, there's an instrument called MOXIE. MOXIE is the Mars Oxygen ISRU experiment. This is the module that's going to be testing in situ resource utilization techniques in the hopes of turning CO2 in the Martian atmosphere into oxygen, just like a tree. The rover is also going to contain a special microphone, which is going to give us the first sound recordings from the surface of Mars. So when it came to picking a spot to land, they were looking for some place that would give them the best opportunity to achieve all their mission goals. And what that means is they needed to find a place that contained rocks that were either formed in or shaped by water. We started as 30 locations, got narrowed down to eight in 2015, and then that got narrowed down to three in 2017. Two of these locations are right next to each other, Jezero Crater and Northeast Sirtis Major. Jezero Crater was filled and emptied repeatedly over millions of years from a nearby lake bed, which gives plenty of opportunity for life to have formed in several different times. And Northeast Sirtis was not only once covered by water, but it was also volcanically active, which means that the water was warm as well. A third location is called Columbia Hills in the Gusev Crater. This is where the Spirit Rover actually confirmed the evidence of liquid water on ancient Mars, which made headlines at the time. So this is a perfect place for the Mars 2020 rover to go and look for signs of microbial life. The Mars 2020 rover is expected to launch in, you guessed it, 2020. August 2020 to be exact, and it's supposed to land in February of 2021. Other missions to Mars include the InSight mission, which may actually land before the Mars 2020 mission. It's going to use sonic imaging to get a map of the interior of Mars. And NASA plans to launch a new Scout mission. The Scout mission that they did back in the day produced the Opportunity and Spirit rovers. It actually solicited designs from all over the world, and they want to do that again. One of the designs that they may pick this time around could actually be a flying drone. All of these are in preparation for manned NASA Mars missions, which should begin sometime in the 2030s. There are also plans in the works for Mars from the European Space Agency, India, China, and Japan as well. Those are worth mentioning, but this is a video about NASA, so I'm going to leave those for another time. But I have been thinking about doing videos on other countries' space programs. If you're interested in that, let me know in the comments. But the Mars 2020 rover is an important next step in our journey to Mars, both to understand its past and its possible human-dominated future. 
So thanks for watching and a big thanks to Fraser Kane for collaborating with me on this. I've been following Universe Today for a long time. I'm sure many of you do as well. If you don't, I encourage you, please go check out his channel. At the very least, go watch his uh, video on Curiosity. It really will give you a deeper understanding of how the Mars 2020 rover is going to work. I also want to thank Brilliant.org for sponsoring this channel. I am happy to promote Brilliant because they really do help you to gain a new understanding of the world, not by throwing facts at you, but by helping you figure these things out yourself. And this is a lot more effective because this is how we learn in life. You know, we encounter problems, we find solutions, we work through it, and it sticks a lot more because it's something we figure out ourselves. And it gives you skills that you can apply to other areas as well. Brilliant has courses on everything from problem solving to gravitational physics to quantitative finance, things that were maybe always kind of just outside of your understanding, but Brilliant makes it easy. Sign up for free at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe and get access to free daily puzzles and brain teasers that help keep your mind sharp and the first 295 people who sign up for the premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses can get 20% off your subscription for life. So go check it out, brilliant.org slash answers with Joe, links in the description. Last but not least, I want to thank the answer files on Patreon to help keep the lights on around here. It is highly appreciated. We have some new people that joined the squad. I want to call them out real quick. We've got Rob PT, Andrew Baker, Brooke Clevenger, Roberto Laura, Emil Forsmark, Michael Truesdell, James Rushing, Lillian Weber, Cameron Halpin, Benjamin Rosner, and Jorge Cazares. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get access to some cool perks that nobody else gets to have. You can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. All right, like and share if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, I encourage you to watch some other videos of mine. And if you like those, please do subscribe because I come back with videos like this every Monday. All right, you guys go out and have an eye-opening week and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.